Well, hello to whoever might be watching this, whether as it goes live at 6 or uh, the recording of it. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube page and Facebook page for for quite some time. Um, and this is this is the last lesson uh, on the letter to the Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians. And you might notice a slight change to the title slide. Um, I had a little subtitle for this whole time, The Supremacy of Christ, and that's true. Um, it's true. I mean, it's, that is, um, that is a huge thing in the book of Colossians, but this past week I decided on this after all this study, I said, I like this Christ is all. And that includes his supremacy. That includes his sufficiency. And that includes the fact that we must submit to him. We must listen to him and follow him. So, um, ever teach these series of lessons again uh i think this is going to be my 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 subtitle to colossians uh, so i made that little change way late in the game because again as i said this is our this is our last um our last lesson on colossians and this will be uh the last sunday night bible class i do for some time it's going to be focusing on our feast nights and uh and then getting kind of a break there on the fourth and fifth sundays whenever those fifth sundays roll around um so here is what we've been working off of and then you know we have uh, we've got sub points to all of this uh, to, to kind of chart our way through the book of colossians and so now we want to we want to deal with Paul's final greetings, which covers quite a few verses there at the end of chapter four. And let me just kind of make a, a comment about these final greetings uh, before we start breaking it down. It's it's kind of tempting to disregard uh, the concluding greetings and and blessing of Paul's letters. You know, because you got this cluster of names, and and you could kind of write it off as an insignificant, irrelevant postscript. Uh, that would be that would be easy to do. But I think I like the way one one scholar put it. He said, you know, here we get a glimpse into the boiler room of the New Testament, and and what he meant by that was is that he these are the names of folks who are laboring in various capacities in various places who are expanding the borders of God's kingdom as it were and the bits of limited information that we get in these uh these greetings are tantalizing and there have been some folks to come up with some pretty fanciful reconstructions of what you know might have been going on or where Paul would have met this person or you know or you know it's it's easy to kind of romanticize some of what we read in these greetings and so we want to we want to try to make sure we don't get caught up in the you know in in the web of our historical spinning and and we don't want to miss the theological and practical cues uh, that these co concluding greetings offer us. Okay, so with that, uh, let's let's start making our way through this. Here is uh, the commendation of Paul's cur uh, couriers or his letter bearers. Uh, he is essentially going to introduce here uh, the guys that are bringing the letter to the Colossians. And so we get a couple of names. The first one is Tychicus. And um, he, he is the first co-worker mentioned by Paul here. Other than what, you know, he mentions, if I'm thinking right, he does mention Timothy in his opening salutation back in chapter 1. Uh, but he is presumably the bearer or the courier for Paul's letter to the Colossians, not to mention Ephesians and Philemon, okay? Uh, 
Incidentally, if you go to Ephesians 6, verses 21 and 22, you will find that what Paul says there about Tychicus is almost identical to what he says about him here. Okay? And uh, we, we, do get, we do get a little background with him if we read through Acts. Uh, when Paul left Ephesus, Tychicus was accompanied by seven other, or not Tychicus, but Paul was accompanied by seven other believers. And among those listed is Tychicus. He is, he is Asian, according to Acts 20 and verse 4. And these men, it appears, were helping Paul deliver the contribution from the Gentile churches to the poor saints of Jerusalem, which is a kind of a thread in Paul's letters of as he's going uh, around these places uh, in his missionary journeys, he is gathering money and um, and and is going to have that sort of pulled together and then given to the poor saints of of Judea or Jerusalem, which, you know, one of the things was a unifying process here. You have kind of mainly Jewish Christians and then all the Gentile Christians and here the Gentile Christians up and the Jewish Christians. So it, it certainly would have, um, of, uh, would have helped in unifying the, the Jewish and Gentile Christians. Um, and, you know, it's clear from what I have here in green that Tychicus wasn't just going to deposit the letter in Colossians. Paul fully expects Tychicus to tell the Colossians about his efforts, um, about, of course, Paul's well-being, how he's doing, even though, of course, he's uh, imprisoned. And all of that would have um, encouraged the hearts, or is expected to encourage the hearts, of the Colossians. So you see here three times, we'll tell you about my activities. You may know how we are. We'll tell you everything that's taken place here. And so, you know, some of us would have liked for him to maybe have included that in this letter, uh, but he thinks it best for Tychicus to just share that information in person. And then Tychicus receives the highest praise a Christian can receive. He's called a beloved brother. He's a cherished Christian. He's called a faithful minister. He is dependable, uh, trustworthy servant in, in Christ's church. And then he's called a fellow servant, which means he doesn't belong to Paul. He belongs to Christ. And so he stands with Paul, not under Paul, per se. Even though, of course, Paul was, a, was an apostle and Tychicus was not. And then we get uh, the mention of Onesimus here. Here he's just called a faithful and beloved brother. And then Paul also highlights that he is a Colossian. Uh, he says he is one of you. And if we did not have the letter to Philemon, this is all we would know about Onesimus right here. And as you can see, Onesimus would also, uh, was also responsible for passing along information about Paul, uh, but we do have Philemon, and so Philemon, it, it, you know, shed some light, more light on Onesimus. That is extremely interesting, and you can you can go again to the uh, to our YouTube channel on the playlist there. Go to the Sunday night Bible class, and you'll see some uh, a series of lessons on postcards from heaven. One of those is on Philemon, so you can get some even more information. But suffice it to say, Onesimus was a runaway slave. And it appears as if he is returning for the first time, okay, uh, with Tychicus here. Presumably Onesimus was um, converted by Paul in Rome. And here he is coming back. And I find it interesting that Paul does not, in, in this letter uh, to the Colossians, he does not call attention to his slave status. He calls attention to his new status in Christ. And you go back to chapter 3. You know, Christ is all in all. And there's no slave or free. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks have, have um, commented that maybe Paul's wording here was strategic to, to that end. 
So we have here the commendation of Paul's couriers, and then we have um, greetings from Paul's companions. Paul has folks that are with him that are wanting to greet uh, the folks there in the Lycus River Valley, uh, which would be Colossae and Laodicea and Hierapolis. Okay, and and I've broken this down. I got this from Wearsby, I believe, but I, I like his breakdown of this of this paragraph verses 10 through 14. And the first thing he has is the men who stayed. And so he's going to highlight three men who were Jews and one man who was a Gentile, three Jewish Christians and one Gentile Christian. So here are the three Jewish Christians. Um, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner greets you. All right. So we, uh, we meet Aristarchus uh, Aristarchus, all the way back in uh, um, Acts 19, 29. He is there designated a Macedonian from, from Thessalonica. And he <laughs> braves the riotous uproar in Ephesus. That's a pretty hair-raising chapter in Acts 19. And he braves that with Paul. And then like Tychicus, he also traveled with Paul to Jerusalem, Acts 20, verse 4. So he was one of the seven men named alongside of Tychicus. And then to Rome, Acts 27, 2. And it may well be that Aristarchus was one of those um, other prisoners that's mentioned in passing in 27, 1 of Acts. Now, Paul does identify him here as a fellow prisoner. Now, some view this as just an honorific title, as if, you know, kind of like a captive of Christ, that it's akin to being a fellow servant or, or fellow soldier. Um, it, it, interestingly, in Philemon 23, Paul apply, applies the phrase fellow prisoner, not to Aristarchus, who's also mentioned in that, in that section, but to Epaphras, who we'll talk some more about in just a moment. Um, and so some think that, um, you know, that, that this is just an honorary title of sorts. They weren't literal prisoners with, with Paul in his imprisonment. But we have to keep in mind that, you know, in uh, Colossians 4.3 and Colossians 4.18, he's going to say in four, back in 4.3, he said, you know, about declaring the mystery of Christ. Christ on account of which I am in prison. So Paul's talking about little prison there, literal prison. And then he's going to say, remember my chains in the very last verse of the book of Colossians. And so it is, it is entirely possible that Aristarchus was imprisoned alongside of Paul and that Epaphras was also imprisoned alongside of Paul. Uh, others thought, well, they might have taken turns uh, spending time with Paul in his quarters. If you go to Acts 28, the imprisonment there is not necessarily what we sometimes think of it as. You know, like Paul's in this cold, dark dungeon and has no uh, contact with the outside world. Uh, it was almost more like a house imprisonment in a way. And so it's possible that Aristarchus and, and Epaphras, that, spending so much time with Paul caring for his needs, um, that they had, in essence, become fellow prisoners, even though perhaps they weren't charged with the crimes that Paul was charged with, because so often Paul's talking about his release or possible release or his case, not so much their case, okay? So anyway, probably more than you wanted to think about there, but that's that. Now Mark is mentioned next. He's called the cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas was... A pretty well-known guy in the ancient world among Christians. He gets a shout-out in Galatians. He gets a, sh a shout-out in Corinthians. Uh, this relationship adds stature to Mark and makes it quite likely that he is the same John Mark mentioned in the book of Acts um, who went on to write the Gospel of Mark. It, and if this is the same guy, and I think it is, uh, then Onesimus is not the only one listed at the end of this letter who has turned a corner. So Onesimus went from a runaway slave to uh, a slave of Christ, as it were. 
And, you know, if you go and read the account in Acts 15, verses 36 through 41, you know that there is a dispute that arose between Barnabas and Paul over Mark. And um, Paul was not fond of bringing Mark on the second missionary journey, but Barnabas wanted to. It's as if Barnabas wanted to give Mark a second chance, because in the first missionary journey, Mark, uh, it appears in Paul's mind, deserted them and left them. Uh, in the middle of that journey. and uh, But whatever might have happened then, things are a bit different now because we learn, you know, not only here but elsewhere uh, that that he had become a comfort to Paul and that he, um, you know, had become, had become uh, a dependable co-worker of Paul's, uh, which is interesting. Now, we don't know the, the content of the instructions here concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. It doesn't seem as if Paul has control over Mark's coming and goings, that he may or may not come, but that if he does come, welcome him. But we don't really know what his, those, those instructions were. Um, and then we have uh, Jesus here who is called Justice. Uh, the name, the Greek name Jesus was popular. It was the, um, you know, the Greek uh, form. Uh, it's Iesus. Uh, Jesus is, of course, our English way. Iesus is the, uh, is the Greek uh, word translated Jesus, but it comes from the Hebrew Joshua or Yeshua, and it was a popular Jewish name really was and um and it was not unusual for jewish people to have a greek or latin name as well and so that's what we have here justice so we have jesus justice um and then notice what we have in green these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of god and they have been a comfort to me uh it does appear though the, the punctuation in the greek's a little weird and it's raised some questions about who's included in this, but it does seem as if Paul intends to include Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus' justice in this. Um, and, and, and in light of the, the heresy in Colossae, which certainly has Jewish underpinnings, uh, this could have been a little strategic thing here. You know, Paul's reminding them, hey, there are guys that are Jewish of the circumcision that... Um, you know, have kind of divested themselves of their religious entitlements, and they've been willing to uh, to give themselves over for the sake of the gospel, in which there is no Jew or Greek or circumcised or uncircumcised, um, and they are they are serving with him in the mission to the Gentiles, uh, and as he says here, they have been a comfort to me. Uh, other scholars have had some other thoughts about this, but them thems are my thoughts on it okay and uh and then from these from these jewish uh this 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 grouping of three jewish guys here who stayed with paul who remained with paul as it were stuck with him um we have a gentile added luke the beloved physician greets you luke of course is a very important man in the early church. He was a Gentile, yet he was chosen by God to write the Gospel of Luke. And I think it's striking that in the span of just uh, two or three verses here, in the close of this letter to the Colossians, two men are mentioned who would go on to write one of our four Gospels. Isn't that interesting? Uh, he is pro Luke is probably the only Gentile writer of any book of the Bible. And besides being um, a careful historian, because not only did he write, of course, the Gospel of Luke, he also wrote the book of Acts, uh, this is the only place that we get an indication of Luke's profession uh, as a physician, uh, a medical doctor, we might say. And, uh, and he evidently had a good reputation. And I think it's interesting that Paul had in his company a physician. Uh, despite, of course, having uh, abilities 
uh, the ability or the, the power uh, to heal people. But Luke was with him. Uh, Luke joined Paul and his party at Troas. You can read about that in Acts um, 16. And Luke traveled with Paul to Jerusalem. And he went on with him uh, to Rome. And we know from 2 Timothy 4.11 that Luke stayed with Paul to the very end. Uh, maybe you saw the movie that was fairly recent, The Apostle Paul, and Luke has a pretty big role in, in that film. And then we have the man who uh, prayed. So we have the men who stayed, Aristarchus, Mark, Jesus, Justice, and Luke. We have the man who prayed. And this is where we get to take a little look at Epaphras. But before we do... I want to show you this picture of the Lycus River Valley again. I shared it way back in the introduction to Colossians. But this will be helpful as we read this little, um, this little couple of verses on Epaphras. And uh, so keep in mind, you know, just kind of burn that image in your head. You get, get an idea of where these, uh, these cities are located. Ephesus would be to the west of Laodicea, would be to the left of Laodicea, you know, probably 100 miles or so. Uh, it's not, not even going to get in this picture, okay? So with that, we, we read this in Colossians 4, 12 through 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, so he's just like Onesimus is one of you, Epaphras is one of you, he is a servant of Christ Jesus, he is a slave of Christ Jesus, language that Paul would often use to describe himself. And he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Uh, always. Uh, Epaphras is one who embodied that uh, admonition that Paul gave the Colossians in Colossians 4.12, continue steadfastly in prayer. Epaphras is a guy who does just that, always, and struggling uh, that word struggle appeared back in chapter 1 and 2, uh, you know, descriptive of Paul's ministry, of Paul's seeking to um, fulfill uh, in his ministry the maturation of the Colossian people or whoever uh, he has converted, that he wants folks to be mature in Christ, and that's, that is what he struggled for. Okay, and here we have that same idea of Paphras in his prayers. It also takes us back to the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Jesus, you know, the Greek here is agonizomai. Jesus agonized in prayer. Epaphras is agonizing in prayer on their behalf. And he's doing that, so it, here's the goal, that they will stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. That really fits uh, a major theme in Colossians, okay? I mean, he he is praying that they will come to understand and to appreciate all that God has done and accomplished in Christ, to see Jesus as the supreme Savior, right? To see Jesus as a sufficient Savior so that they will not become easy marks for the false teachers that are in their midst, Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And we, we know from uh, Colossians 1, 7, it appears as if Epaphras was the, the, the one who planted the church in Colossae. And it seems as if he had a hand in planting the church in Laodicea and Hierapolis as well, uh, that he evangelized, as it were, the Lycus River Valley. And at this point, he can't be with them. He is with Paul in Rome. If we have rightly deduced that that's where Paul was imprisoned at this time, but it doesn't mean that he's forgotten these congregations or these people. Uh, he, he continues to struggle, agonize on their behalf in prayer. And then we have the man who strayed. Now that... As you'll see, this is uh, going back to the verse on Luke. But look at this. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. And so it's not in Colossians 4 that we learn that Demas strayed, but it is at least a launching pad to look at the other, 
the two other places Demas is mentioned in Scripture. Another place is Philemon 23:24. Paphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. So, you know, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke. All these guys are mentioned in Colossians, and they're mentioned again in Philemon, okay? And um, Demas here, like these other guys who stayed, is referred to as a fellow worker. But the reason why we're using, and or why I think, you know, Wearsby used the man who strayed is because of this. In 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 10, um, that should be your, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now, we're not real sure, um, you know, what, specifically to to make of this um now i think some scholars have tried to sugarcoat this some have even tried to say that demas was in love with this present world that, that he was in love with with you know uh, the souls of human beings that he he cared so much for the souls of human beings that he decided to leave paul and go preach the gospel in Thessalonica. That's how some people have actually tried to interpret this. So they would interpret the loving the world here in the John 3, 16 sense of for God so loved the world. Uh, but I don't think that's what's at play here. I think Demas fell in love with the world in the 1 John 2, 15 through 17 sense when it says do not love the world or the things of the world. Um and, and the word deserted here just has a pejorative ring to it, that he deserted Paul. And Paul does supply a reason why he deserted him is because he is in love with this present world. Uh, and, and if based on what we have from, from Scripture, at least, it, it seems like Demas is a guy who had a good beginning but had a bad end. It's kind of like the thorny soil, you know, that Jesus talks about in Luke 18, 8, verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And so Demas, in, in the end, at least from, from what we have from biblical revelation, of course, we, who, who knows, maybe he had a change of heart after this. And that's what you hope for. But from the biblical record, it doesn't look good for Demas. And so that's why we have the men who stayed, the man who prayed, and the man who strayed. All right, so then we, we get to, um, you know, Paul has just given some greetings from some of his fellow workers to the Colossians. And here Paul wants to greet some folks that are at least near Colossae. So here is um, a little verse that, uh, you know, has raised some questions. Uh, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Um, scholars question whether Nympha here is to be associated with Laodicea or if she is to be associated with Colossae, or perhaps even Hierapolis. Um, and and then the, the, that's one question. And then the next question is, uh, is Nympha, should that be read as a male Nymphus instead of Nympha? And, um, and, and so there's, the manuscript tradition on this is interesting. Uh, as to the first question, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. It's almost like, hey, there's the congregation Laodicea. And then is he saying, and then particularly, you know, the church that's meeting in Nymphus house at Laodicea. Or does he mean a, a different area altogether, you know, uh, besides Laodicea? Uh, hard to say. And as for the, um, as for how we should read uh, the name here, ESV obviously went with a female name. If you have an NKJV, they have the male name. The KJV and NKJV went with the male name. And there's a reason for it. Um, 
here's here's kind of how this works out. Um, the earliest text did not, you know, supply accent marks, and and so those texts that do, if they add a, a little mark on the last syllable, that would make the name masculine. If they add a, a particular accent on the first syllable, that makes the name female. And um, and so then you're like, well, you know, the the, the manuscript tradition there is, is divided. But then you're like, well, look at that pronoun, her. Maybe it's maybe that's what will seal this. Well, here's what's weird. Some texts read his house. Others read her house. And still others have their house, which would include the brothers, okay? That, that this is the that the brothers in Nympha have a church meeting in their house there in Laodicea, see. Um, the feminine reading seems to be to best explain how the others may have developed. And this is in textual criticism, this is one of those kind of interesting canons, you know, they, they have these kind of rules that the more difficult reading, for instance, is to be preferred because... Uh, when they when you talk about a reading that's difficult, the tendency of scribes was to smooth it out, right? To make it less difficult. So when you're like faced with a choice as to which reading's best, if there's one a reading that would be more difficult than the other, you often retain the difficult reading. And similarly here, you would um, you know there there would have been a tendency to make this a a masculine name if it had a, originally been feminine. And the, the logic there is that, you know, some would have thought that her having the church in her house would necessarily imply that she had a leadership role in the church in some official capacity. And so some were like, well, that can't be true. So therefore, we're going to go with a, with a male name. Okay. Uh, we just feel better about that. But hey, you know, I, we, we have ladies doing some, you know, providing their house. I think about Lydia um, in Acts 16. Uh, you know, it, it's possible for this to be a church that's meeting in a woman's house. Maybe she was unmarried. Maybe she was widowed, uh, something like that. But um, without necessarily saying that she was like the leader of the church, okay? Um, so there she just, you know, it's, it's amazing what one verse can, can uh, you know, what kind of, commentary it can create and then we've got instructions for the congregation at Colossae so you know we've had the commendation of Paul's letter bearers uh, we've had greetings from some of Paul's companions and then greetings to some Christians at least near Colossae if not in it and then we have instructions for the congregation that meets there in Colossae and so here we have the first instruction and this this right here is um, another verse that has uh, created a lot of speculation and commentary and debate. But here's what the text says. And when this letter has been read among you. Okay, what letter is he talking about there? He's talking about the Colossian letter. You know, when you've read this letter this, that Tychicus and Onesimus have delivered to you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Um, so the instruction assumes that at some point the Colossians will go to Laodicea with, with their letter, at least a copy of their letter, and that they will retrieve a copy of the letter that the Laodiceans had received. And of course, the, the reference to this letter poses some interesting questions. Who wrote the letter? What happened to it? Now, because Paul says here not, you know, read the letter, you know, to Laodicea or whatever, it says from Laodicea, some contend that the letter was written by the Laodiceans to Paul or that the letter was written to, um, to the church in Colossae or that the letter was written to Epaphras. And others, you know, others suggest, no, this is a letter that was written by Epaphras to the Laodiceans, but I'm thinking since Paul knows about the letter and since Paul 
uh, can decide who can read it and whatnot. It seems best to think that this letter was written by Paul. Uh, the phrase, the letter from Laodicea, reflects an epistolary style that views things from the perspective of the Colossians. Okay? Um, you know, that they that they are going to get a letter from Laodicea that Paul had written to the Laodiceans. Okay? So others have tried to identify this letter from Laodicea, assuming that Paul was the writer of it, with one of the canonical letters. Because, you know, if you open up your Bible, you do not have, you know, we have Colossians, and we have Philippians, we have, like, Ephesians, but we don't have Laodiceans, okay? And so we're like, well, what's the deal? Well, some have said, I bet you Hebrews is the letter that Paul is referring to here. And they try to make some sort of connection. And then some have even said, well, maybe maybe he's referring to the letter Philemon, you know, because they are pretty close, Philemon and, 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 the, and the letter to the Colossians. Uh, but others have, have said that the letter in question here is none other than the letter we know as Ephesians. And, um, and this, this latter nominee probably has the most merit. Though it's, it's unprovable, it, it is at least very plausible. Uh, J.B. Lightfoot argued years ago that Ephesians was a circular letter intended for more than one audience without giving you know, spe specific greetings or advice tailored to a specific setting. Marcion uh, he's often referred to as the heretic Barcian. He was apparently the first to make the connection by giving our canonical Ephesians the title to the Laodiceans in the canon, the Marcion canon as it's called. You know, he had a list of the books he felt were, you know, canonical. And he has listed there t Laodiceans. And you're like, well, what? He doesn't have Ephesians listed as the Laodiceans listed. And so some have conjectured that maybe his copy of Ephesians was lacking that addressee in Ephesus. And in fact, in fact, the phrase in Ephesus is absent from some of those manuscripts that are generally regarded as the most reliable. Now, the majority of manuscripts do have in Ephesus, but some of our earliest and best manuscripts are missing that phrase in Ephesus. And so, you know, you're kind of, you're left to decide between quality and quantity here. And so, you know, most have just sided with, let's just put an Ephesus in there. But it, it, leads, it leaves the door open that por perhaps... The letter that we know as Ephesians was a, set, a circular letter, an encyclical letter that was going to make its way through the churches there in Asia Minor and, of course, down in the Lycus River Valley. The Col and, and, and there is a close association, I mean, in language and, and all of that between Ephesians and Colossians. There's a lot of parallels between the two letters, but there are some differences, and those differences account for why Paul wrote a separate letter just to the Colossians, because they were dealing with a certain heresy. Not to say that their letter wouldn't be useful to the other churches in the area, but you know this is just scholars trying to figure out why didn't Paul just write one letter and send it to all of them? Why did he write a circular letter, you know, and then and then write a um, a separate letter to the Colossians? So, um. So yeah, you know, there, it's interesting stuff. But let's let's just go a little further here. Um, in the fourth century, there was a letter that came to light called, I think, to the layout of sins or something like that. And you can you can get a copy. I mean, you can Google this and you can read it, and and you'll see that it's got a lot of snippets of sort of Pauline phraseology in it and all of this. But today, unanimously, folks are like that thing is forged. It is not worth the paper it was written on per se, um, and that there was maybe an impetus for that. Uh, some folks thinking, hey, I'm going to supply a void here. We have a lost letter of Paul, and maybe somebody looked to capitalize on that. Uh, and there's other reasons that have been given for its appearance. And the only, 
think the only copy we have of it is in Latin, okay? Um, so there's that. But let's just say, let's just say that this connection between Ephesians and Laodiceans is misplaced, that, that this letter is actually a letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea and that that letter is lost. We don't have it. Does that mean we're, we're, we're done? Does that mean we're missing something? Does that mean we're, we, ha we have an incomplete canon, something like that? I would argue that if we were to unearth a letter, you know, to the Laodiceans, that it would help us historically, might fill in some historical gaps here and there that, you know, we, in our historical reconstructions, provide us some more information that might be helpful along those lines. I'd say that it'd help us homiletically. You know, we're preaching on a particular subject and we could get in there and find some turns of phrase or an argument or something that could help support our, our preaching uh, on a particular topic. But I don't expect the letter to uh, to have something in it that we don't already have as far as doctrine goes. Um, I think we have preserved for us what God wanted preserved for us. I do. Uh, but but I do I do lean toward the conclusion that we haven't lost this letter, that we still have it, and that we know it as the letter to the Ephesians. All right, here's the second instruction that the uh that paul gives the the congregation there at colossae i mean one was you're going to exchange letters with laodicea the second one is this say to chippus see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received from the lord um it's kind of cryptic uh, and i say that because it raises a question is this to be taken as a warning or is it to be taken as, you know, supportive encouragement, right? Is is Paul saying, hey, you need to you need to remind our Chippus because it seems like he's forgotten that he needs to fulfill the ministry that he has received from the Lord, or is it, hey, say to our Chippus, you know, to build him up, to encourage him, uh, to keep on keeping on? Um, I, I tend to see it in the latter way. Uh, the charge to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 5 is similar in Greek. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Uh, in Timothy's case, it's doing the work of an evangelist. I think it's, I just think this exhortation here is to be, probably to see it more in terms of encouragement than, than warning. Uh, and we can do more than guess at the particular ministry that Archippus was to fulfill. Some think that maybe, and he is mentioned in the letter to Philemon, by the way, some think that maybe he was kind of the, the minister that has, um, is filling the void that Epaphras left, that that's, that that's what his role was in, in, in the Lycus River Valley or, or particularly in Colossae. Um, so there's those instructions. And then finally, we have the greeting from Paul himself. And so Paul um, writes, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, Remember my chains, grace be with you. Paul customarily, it appears, dictated his letters to an amanuensis, you know. And that, but he would often take up the pen toward the end and he would, you know, write his final greeting uh, with his own hand as if to authenticate his letter. Uh, some have said that it would it would have been very you know some have thought he'd write very big letters because his eyesight was bad and some have made comments that you know it could have been shaky because of the shackles on his wrist i i think that's getting a little romantic there um but uh there are several passages where paul calls attention to in his letters at the end of some of his letters hey i'm you know I'm authenticating. I am writing this in my own hand, uh, because there was a there was there is evidence even in the the New Testament that there were um, pseudepigraphal letters, pseudo letters, claiming to be from Paul that were being circulated. And here was a way that Paul could authenticate that the letter was in fact from him. Um, and his appeal to remember his chains here has 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 been variously interpreted. 
Some have said that it's kind of like a, a, a reminder of his paradoxical authority, that he is an apostle. But, but look at the links that he is willing to go for Christ, that that, that, that commands uh, certainly a deep level of respect. So some have tried to read it in that way. Some have read it as just a forlorn plea for pity. Remember my chains. It's terrible here. You know, um, that seems l- <laughs> less likely uh, because Paul had a way of being content in all circumstances. Uh, it, it may be a plea for intercessory, uh, intercessory prayer, you know, maybe, maybe freedom for freedom so that he can have unrestricted um, uh, access to the world so that he might preach the gospel. Or maybe prayer for strength is implied. And then some say it's a it's a note of encouragement for those who may also suffer persecution for their faith. And maybe some of these are not mutually exclusive, right? But he just says, remember my chains, grace be with you. I'll transition from here just to some, some, some preaching points uh, as we bring the letter to Colossians to a close. Um, I've loved studying this letter. It's been... Uh, it's been good. Put together a lot of slides on it, a lot of notes. Um, you know, if you're interested in the in the content in a written form, um, I can get it to you. Uh, but here is just some closing uh, points that I'd like to make based on these final greetings. And I think I think each of these points will preach pretty good. Um, here is the the first one, like Paul. We should inspire love and loyalty. This is a neat point, but some have harbored the suspicion that Paul was a loner or that Paul was insufferable or that Paul was was hard to get along with, you know, that he was just so bent on his mission that he, he could just be an uncomfortable companion. But the long list of Paul's co-workers here Read Romans 16. I suggest that that he was able to inspire tremendous loyalty and commitment on the part of other people. I mean, those listed here in Colossians risked personal danger by staying close to the apostle. They faced the danger of being bullied by the rough characters assigned to guard prisoners. Uh, they... You know, uh, there, there's the danger being too closely linked to someone deemed a danger to national security like Paul was. But their, their presence, uh, their, their assistance would have heartened Paul emotionally, spiritually, during the difficult days of his confinement and as he is waiting, you know, to hear a decision about his case. Um, Paul... For all of the uh, respect we have for him, for all that he accomplished in, in the first century in his ministry, for all that he suffered, um, he'd probably be the first to tell you that he didn't do it on his own. And that's not just saying that he had God with him. That's true. But he had people around him that loved him and that supported him and that helped him um, accomplish uh, so much in uh, in his missionary journeys. Here's a second point. Like Mark and Onesimus, we should never consider our failures to be final. Uh, the story, the stories of these two men remind us that failure does happen, but failure need not be final. Those who have triumphed over their failure, or in spite of their failures, recognize that they may have had a failure, perhaps many, but they were not failures. Failures, as one writer put it, may simply be underpasses that lead to success. C.S. Lewis wrote, No amount of falls will really undo us if we keep picking ourselves up each time. 
We shall, of course, be very muddy and tattered children by the time we reach home. But the bathrooms are all ready, the towels put out, and the clean clothes in the airing cupboard. The only fatal thing is to lose one's temper and give up. Here's another point. Uh, like Epaphras, we should pray continually, fervently, and personally. You go back to what was said about Epaphras. We notice that he always, always was praying for those churches in the Lycus River Valley. Uh, he took Colossians 4, 12 seriously. He, he didn't just pray when he felt like it. He didn't just pray when he found the time for it. Um, he, he was constantly in prayer. He prayed fervently. You know, the Greek word there, struggling, uh, agonizomai, that was a word used to describe uh, athletes as they gave themselves fully to their sports. You know, and if, and if those of us in the church put as much concern and enthusiasm into our praying as we do into our sports, it's a wonder what would occur in our churches and in our communities. And then you'll notice that he also prayed personally. He did not pray around the world for everybody in general or nobody in particular he centered his intercession on those churches and christians in the lycus river valley he no doubt mentioned some of them by name prayer for epaphras was not an impersonal religious exercise he was praying to the god of the universe who could do far above anything he could imagine and he was praying for the people that he carried around in his heart and then one, one last point. Unlike Demas, but like Archippus, we're giving Archippus the benefit of the doubt here, we should finish what we have started. Again, from the biblical record, it doesn't appear as if Demas finished what he started. Um, but taking that note uh, that... You know, that Paul, it's like Paul told the Colossians, this is what I want you to say to your brother Archippus. See that you fulfill the ministry that God gave to you. And uh, for whatever reason, I feel like Archippus did. And so we got to be people who finish what we have started. All right, uh, that's it. That's the book of Colossians. Um and again, it, it's going to be on there probably, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to say forever, but it's there. And uh, perhaps you've missed some of these lessons along the way and want to go fill in the gaps. Uh, but I hope, I hope this uh, series of lessons have been, have been uh, beneficial to you and enlightening, challenging. And I'm not saying that I'm not going to do this again because very well probably will be at some point, but going to take a hiatus for a little while and, um, and, and preparing these each week and focus on our feast night and focus on some more personal work. Certainly hoping that COVID is going to, uh, you know, all the restrictions and, and all the regulations and all of that stuff that that is going to slowly, but surely, you know, I'd love to say something other than slowly, but at least surely we'll begin to kind of dissipate and relax and we get some normalcy and I can start um, seeing people and visiting people on a regular basis. So anyway, hey, thanks, thanks for watching and may God bless you.